One of the things we seem to have learned from the epidemic is the importance of what's being called the social determinants of health on the way that epidemics spread. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we see uh, Occupy Toronto and parks here and across the, around the world actually looking at the distribution of resources and focusing in on the fact that 1% uh, of the population is consuming and appropriating uh, increasing, uh, a increasing percentage of those kinds of resources, right. where the other 99% are finding ourselves with healthcare systems falling apart, uh, public health falling apart, education systems falling apart. Is this connect somehow, do you think? It's called capitalism. It's, called it's, cap not, a, it's <laughs> not a mystery to me. It may be a mystery to others. Yes. It's called an ideological system which is ultimately oppressive and embraces inequality mm -hmm. and compromises the lives that the majority of citizens lead. Mm -hmm. The majority of citizens, however, well, not the majority, but a significant minority of citizens continue to vote for the very governments that are doing them damage. So I'm hoping that what the Occupy movement has done across North America, mm -hmm. not merely in Toronto, but across Canada, across the United States, and now very much present in, in Europe. I hope that the Occupy movement has had some impact on raising awareness about the essential unfairness, the essential injustice of the lives people lead. But that's how capitalism thrives. You do as little as you can for human well-being in order to encourage the profits of the few. And the few have been making obscene profits. And by the way, uh, it doesn't seem to be changing. The, the banks that caused this tremendous financial meltdown across the world in 2008-2009 have begun handing out these obscene corporate bonuses yet again. Mm -hmm. So you have to ask yourself, do we ever learn? Will the Occupy movement actually be a turning point? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to answer that, but it's the first powerful glimmer of hope. And so you think that would have... Uh a domino effect on the way that the, uh, the epidemic is spreading if the Occupy movement and those kinds of challenges to this hugely unequal distribution of wealth become stronger. Well, you make a very good point when you ask about the social determinants of health, because whether it's poor health or whether it's a lack of housing or whether it's poverty or whether it's the absence of daycare or whether it's uh, insecurity of jobs and employment, all of these things come together in a kind of conspiracy to undermine individual and collective well-being. Mm -hmm. Makes people more vulnerable mm -hmm. to disease, makes people more vulnerable to, to uh, frantic sexual patterns of behavior. I mean, these are just, this is the truth of the society we live in and we seem to care very little for people who are struggling with these injustices. You spoke uh, a little bit about um, the pharmaceutical industry, the uh, way that uh, they have attempted to undermine reform of CAMAR. Of, uh, CAM uh, we had the other situation back in the late 90s where they were actually suing the South African government mm -hmm. to prevent them from using um, <coughs> generic drugs. What kind of uh, control do we need on the pharmaceutical industry to begin to make sure that their job is to provide medicines for people to make them better uh, and not to interfere in, in fact, uh, distribution of medicines to make people better? I think the, the, um, the first thing to note, and it's important, is that this is the single most powerful lobby in the world. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, the pharmaceutical industry is more powerful than oil and gas, more powerful than mining, the lobby in the United States is the most effective and the most influential of any lobby on Congress. And the power of the pharmaceutical industry and what they say and do is without limit. Uh, so what you need is a very strong regulatory mechanism that governments are not afraid to impose on the pharmaceutical industry and that you're not afraid to issue compulsory licenses so that generic equivalents, perfectly uh, legal and perfectly composed of the various ingredients, so that they're available as brand name drugs are available and you can lower the price in the process. Uh, you've got to maintain a certain capacity of the drug manufacturers to do the research and development in some areas. They don't do nearly as much as is suggested. The universities do have much, much more than is acknowledged. But there is some research and development in the drug industry and it requires a lot of investment and they have a right to make a profit. They're in the private sector, but, but they don't have a right to make a profit at the expense of people who need the drugs and are too poor to purchase them. 
and they, they have to be regulated more strongly. But I mention their power only to say it's not going to be easy. You're really taking on Goliath. Thank you.